Okay, on the motion, this house prefers a world in which success and failure are seen as a consequence of random factors rather than personal actions. I'd like to welcome the first speaker of the proposition to open this debate. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, uh, POIs in the chat, please pronounce she, her. I'm going to start my speech in three, two, one. Panel, I'm sure our opponents, just like us, have spent so many hours training this past year that any difference in the work we have put in becomes marginal. When only one team, however, is crowned champion at the end of the day, we would far prefer a world wherein drop teams are not considered to be less hardworking, but more so that the loss was the necessary result of the random selection of motions. Two points of context. Number one, what is the definition of success? And number two, what's her stance in debate today? Number one, on success, two points. We think on both sides of the house, Success is an objective metric determined not by yourself, but by the rest of society. We think you can only be considered successful insofar as the majority of the world thinks you are. We also think, too, that success must be scarce and exclusive. These two points are because, number one, if everyone is successful, no one is successful. But more importantly, too, success is only desirable insofar as the rest of society wants to achieve the same and are currently unable to. Our stance today are threefold. Number one, on proposition, we we far value self-determined individual progress. Note the difference between progress and status of success and failure is twofold. One, it is self-determined, as in you compare yourself not to those around you, but to you of yesterday. And two, progression does not guarantee success. Our second stance is that we think success necessitates not only progression, but largely random factors. Thirdly, we think this understanding on proposition side far better addresses existing inequalities and as a result allows far or better self-actualization and happiness on our side of the house. Two claims to sustain it today. Number one, how we address the arbitrary nature of success, and how two, we secure individual happiness. We think in the status quo, success itself is a very arbitrary concept. This looks like two things. Number one, the birth lottery, as in it makes a huge difference as to which kinds of households and circumstances you were born into. Do you have a lot of disposable incomes? Do your parents invest a lot of time and energy into you? these? We think all these things are very arbitrary and are also very influential to you as a human being. This is incredibly important because this means people start off lives at very different points. And then this also means that success is far easier when you come from a wealthier family than a lower income family. The second reason why we think success is arbitrary is just the randomness of life in general, as in individuals do not have power over larger things that influence our lives. That's just business trends or like the recession economy. It also looks like going to the bait tournament and being given a skewed motion, for instance. Notice that you working harder or making certain wise decisions will not stop these factors from affecting your life. It doesn't matter you had studied an extra debate topic or speak more if the debate motion was ordered that way by chance. So why does opposition aggravate this randomness? We think necessarily opposition credit your personal action far more as a factor of your success. This means you necessarily mute criticism of bad luck as an explanation for your failure. Notice that the people who benefit from these kinds of randomness or birth lotteries do not have an incentive to call out that they did benefit from this randomness. And these people are thus credited far more for their success than what they actually put in here. The impact here is that you mute social discussion on birth lottery and social justice as a whole. We think proposition actually solved this issue on our side of the house, given that recognition in it itself, we think in a world where we recognize that arbitrary factors play far more a significant role into your success, we acknowledge the inequality of lottery factors. We think as a result, people are more willing to vote against things that reinforce arbitrariness and inequality. The reason for this is that the vast majority of people are not beneficiaries of birth lotteries, by, but, but harmed by it, so they will be more willing to vote. This looks like more people voting for things like welfare schemes that shield you against restrictions and less likely to buy into right-wing narratives that your success is dependent on your hard work alone. On the flip side, these kinds of right-wing narratives like, oh, immigrants are responsible for all the bad things that happen to them, carry far more weight among middle-class voters if opposition is allowed to perpetrate their kind of narrative. But the second impact is that we create a far better political climate to discuss things like white privilege, for instance, because in the status quo, the reason why a lot of people refuse to acknowledge white privilege exists is because they don't want to accept that their success was isn't in fact their own. So when a society has accepted our narrative, as in, as in uh, success is largely determined by random factors, moderate voters are less offended against policies like affirmative actions because they now don't see it as an attack against themselves, but it's a rescaling of the existing inequality. Before moving on to the second substantive, I'll take that point. 
would civil rights have happened without conscious efforts by the black community in the United States? We think, uh, we think that efforts from the black community in the United States have always existed. We think the tipping point to which it uh, it, it accumulates into success is largely due to happenstance and random chance and opportunities more than anything else. With, uh, before, uh, let's move on then. Second substantive on how we better secure individual happiness. The setup here is quite simple. The majority of people in society will lead mediocre or unsuccessful lives because success on its own is very likely as per our framing, as in very few people achieve it. So why then is opposition very problematic under the status quo? We think they force this feelings of insufficiency on people, as in they think that uh, people are not doing enough in their lifetime and more importantly, not hustling enough. This creates a harrowing narrative to be already leading difficult life, people who are single, working mothers, being told they're not richer with a happier family because they're not working hard enough. This is incredibly hurtful to those who are already working hard, but simply do not have the random luck that pe most people need in order to succeed. The impact here is that people feeling proud of, of, of what they have done in life is a tipping point of self-actualization. So the people who live in middle class in the 50s and probably will change their lives, opposition condemns them that this is will not change their life. Opposition condemns condemns these people that their lack of life or existence or like uh, their lack of success is due to their fault and this is failure panel but even if people do feel compelled to desire success opposition creates an environment where it shames people because they're not successful this is because uh, people on opposition side believe success is a result of personal ability this is the reason why a lot of corporations like goldman sachs for instance push people to work like 70 hours a week because it reinforces the belief that success is based on choice that if you decide to work Work more hours, you become more successful. This this invites questions like, oh, why aren't you treating your family to vacation in France? Because the reason behind you not being able to do this is a choice of you not working more. The impact here is that you feel things like hedonistic treadmill, where people are forced to always work or always live with a certain shame of not working or not working enough. So every minute you don't work, panel, we think you feel like you are preventing yourself from success. We think you give far more power to corporations to control control their employees and keep them at their desk and away from things like spending their time with family. Why then on our side is very much preferable to this very, very sad alternative on the opposition side. We think we actually alleviate the self-shame that people add. We think we allow people to be okay with what they have, as in you don't compel people to want more. This note panel is a great impact because of number one, the framing we give you up top, but also more importantly, that most people know, find them in positions that cannot be described as success. The reason why we are good is the self-actualization at whatever positions they're at, the recognition of the progress you have done, and be happy with it. At the end of the day, the impact is that we make people far happier on our side of the house because we allow far more people to achieve happiness at their status in life, which, as we have told you, is more likely than not unchangeable. Note panel, at the end of the day, on the metric of vulnerability and magnitude of impact, proposition making the people who are not currently achieving success feel better about themselves is way more important than the people who are getting success who would be more or less happy on either side. And so panel, when we take these vulnerable stakeholders into account, proposition thinks we are the only one who, uh, who help them achieve happiness. So proud to propose. All right, I thank the speaker for that speech. Uh, can I just check if the panel is ready? If you are, just give a thumbs up. Okay, uh, Lucas, you ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. All right, uh, to open this debate for the opposition, can we have the first speaker of the opposition? Here, here. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect.
Okay. Chair adjudicators, ladies and gentlemen, proposition's narrative mutes all of your achievements, unlocks those who fail in a prison of comfort. A cell with cushioned walls, which tells you that working harder wouldn't have made a difference. You were simply born to fail. On our side, we acknowledge the factors that make absolute success more difficult, but instead of burying our heads in the, in the sand, we strive for relative success. Very proud to oppose. What is our stats? What? On our side, people feel like they are in control of their destiny. People can see their lot in life and they can take steps to improve their life. There is a belief that if they can work hard, they can achieve success. Second, about breaking down barriers. Here's the analogy here. On our side, people can see that not everyone begins from the same starting blocks on the sprinting track. Some people are disadvantaged and begin running behind the start line. Some people are privileged and begin running ahead of the start line, but they can change their fate to improve the speed at which they run at. On our side, they are able to do that. And third, success is seen as relative. So if you were poor and become middle class, that is a success. If you couldn't read for 10 minutes straight and now you can read for 20 minutes, that is a success. So in general, we agree with prop, but we do not believe that success has to be zero sum. I'm gonna give a few responses to their case. The first claim they make here is that success is arbitrary because of things like the birth lottery, the randomness of life, and that's bad because social discussion disappears. Four responses. One, success is not as arbitrary if they're, if they, as they claim. If I study more, if I practice more, I will tend to do better. It's not clear that just because it was arbitrary that it mutes the entire extent of that achievement. Second, even if success was arbitrary, it was not absolute or totalizing. That is, people take into account what type of background you came from. If you were poor and then you became middle class, people still view that as a success. And this is where their claim about having no social discussion simply doesn't make any sense, right? Currently, we live in the most socially aware uh, society where people take into account people's backgrounds. We talk about things like white privilege, about wasps in the US, and why companies have things like quotas. Their point is simply not true. Third, assuming success is a good thing, they get less of it because the, because the reason why people pursue success is because it makes them feel good. On their side, once you believe that success is just a random product that happened because of happenstance in the birth lottery, it doesn't feel as good when you win. You just believe that was something that was destined to happen. And four then, when they talk about their comparative, I think we would like a little bit more picture painting in their next speech so they have to stand over, be very clear about exactly what they stand over. I'm gonna forward two arguments. First, why we get more success. And second, why this is better for minorities. Within the first point, I'm gonna to respond to their second claim. Okay, what does their world look like? It is by necessity, one that is predetermined to some degree. Because if success is a result of random factors, like i.e. stochastic success, then how much of a claim do I have over my own successes or failures? When they talk about the birth lottery, those types of questions reduce success. And this responds to their second point. How does this occur? Two ways. First, every single time I win, it doesn't feel as good because I don't get as much dopamine. And the reason for that is because I feel good after winning because I really worked hard to get where I did. I studied hard for the test, whereas Team Vietnam believes that they might have studied really hard to get as far as they have in this competition. I was the one who worked hard to make all of that happen. But on their side, I feel dejected after every single success. And this is amplified by every single time I have a small win, the millions of times it happens throughout my life, reinforcing this idea that I was, that, that every single success and this moment was just bound to happen. That that success was not my own. It was the product of my, of my parents parenting me, or it was just pure luck. Second, every time I lose, it doesn't hurt as much. Why? Because on our side, there is a sense of pride that you have that you can maintain a level of quality in your performance, in your relationships, in your work, in your hobbies. On their side, when that quality falters, when you don't perform poorly at work, when you make mistakes in a violin recital, it doesn't hurt as much because who knows how well you would have done anyway. It was simply due to the random factors like how much you slept, how much you practiced, which wasn't anything to do with you, right? Because the fact that you decided to practice today was maybe the result of you were just born that way or because your parents happened to raise you that way. Every single time you lose, you now write that off as something that was engendered. You have no motivation to try any harder. What was the consequence of this? Two things. First, people become dejected and feel a sense of hopelessness. They don't try hard to improve themselves because they fundamentally believe they are surrounded by the narrative that their destiny was never in their own control. On our side, when you're overweight, you believe that going for a walk or trading a steak for a salad can eventually allow you to look like the way that you want to. But on their side, you believe that your genetics will never allow you to lose weight, so you go back to McDonald's. So notice that considering they consider success to be a good thing, they get less of it on their side. Second, this debate is not only about social mobility and getting jobs and like Goldman Sachs or whatever. It's about the micro successes, working to improve your relationships, picking up a hobby and becoming skilled in it, studying in a subject that you are bad at. These encompass a vast majority of successes and are oftentimes most fulfilling for the individual. 
But crucially, they're not difficult to do. And so people on net are more satisfied on our side of the house. It's about the millions of moments, about the micro, success, micro successes throughout your life that simply add up. On the comparative, why will people become more successful on our side? First, on agency. Note that there exists agency, even if there is inequality. You can go to school, you can get a job, you can start a business. You are in control of your own fate and therefore feel a sense of responsibility. On our side, you believe that even though social anxiety makes you nervous when interacting with other people, you can still call someone when you feel alone. That's in your control and power. On their side, you believe that you'll, they'll never pick up the phone because you're not funny or interesting enough to be worth their time. Second, on the power of practice. Practice just means you get much better because you iron out the mistakes that make you bad in the first place. You can practice studying, you can practice an instrument, you can pr practice communication in your relationships. All these improvements are successes that you can only get on our side. Third, I just note the trend of increasing social mobility in the world, which as a result of quotas, corrects for previous injustices, the prevalence of the internet, et cetera, which ultimately uh, uh, deals with their second point. So in conclusion, on our side, people work harder when they encounter failures. They feel a sense of pride and utility when you win. When you have worked day and night for years to afford your medium-sized home, you feel elated and satisfied. You embrace your home. On their side, you feel no such joy because that house was gotten through luck. If only you'd been born a bit richer and you had gotten that house. So I'll take that point now. Do you not think it is far easier for people to reach out to say their crush if they think their uh, possible rejection is not due to the fact that, oh, they were ugly or, 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 or something, but more so because of random factors instead, as in it's not reflective of them as a person? Well, of course, it has to be reflective of them as a person. I, I, the reason why you would reject someone is because of some reason why they don't like you in the first place. And the reason why they didn't like you in the first place was because of the precise reason they told you. You weren't funny enough. You weren't friendly enough. You were just kind of weird or you weren't attractive enough. Those are the types of things that just only get reinforced forced on your side of the house and makes people's quality of life so much worse worth living. So ultimately, on the way here, every single person will have minor successes and setbacks in your life, but their quality of life is ultimately higher on our side. Second argument, this is better for minorities. Note our frame here that we can see that structural barriers exist. Our world is one in which people are told that they have the power to overcome and challenge those barriers, i.e. they are not defined by them. That looks like where there's massive in economic inequality, we can fight for fairer economic systems. Where your society is deeply racist, we can help build on which is more accepted. Your world is transphobic, we can play a part in breaking them down. How is this happening? Or how is our side better? One, because I want to point out that notice that on their side, it's also far easier to justify these groups as inferior. Because this, this, uh, this is because you now believe that people were simply born this way. But there's no point trying to help these groups because they were unfortunately just happened to be born violent as a result of violent factors, or they were poor at academics. And note this also applies to rehabilitating prisoners. If you view criminals as people who are always going to be that way, they were just innately violent criminals, then there's no point in trying to rehabilitate. But second, we didn't think black people chose to be black people. We still segregated them in the US. But this means on their side, black people now have to accept their condition because that was simply the way history panned out. There was no point in trying to change your standing because that was ultimately how random factors just played out. So for those reasons, we are so proud to oppose. All right, extend the speaker for that speech. Uh, checking if the... Sorry, is it just me or is Athena frozen? Uh, checking your team. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, Athena, checking the internet is all right? Or team Ireland in general? Because you froze for a moment there. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, can. That's good. Yeah, sorry. I think Athena froze for a moment, so just wanted to double check. Yeah, sorry. As I was saying, uh, judges, are you ready? Let me know with a thumbs up. All right. Uh, to continue this debate for proposition, uh, can we have the second speaker of the proposition? Here you go. Okay, I'll take POIs in the chat if I'm audible and visible. Uh, three, two, one. I want to note at the top a couple strategic points. Strategic point number one, 
our opponents are trying to minimize success in this debate, talking about like, quote, micro successes. I want to note why our definition on success based on relativity is far more important, because we think in order for this narrative on like what success is accredited to, to work on either side of the house, it needs to have some level of exclusivity and needs to bank on the fact that more people are mediocre, given it needs to explain why success happened versus why it does not. So this micro successes argument, I don't think it's very strategic and really cuts both ways. But also, let's note that people on our side don't just become random gamblers and just don't do hard work. Two reasons for this that don't go engaged with. Number one, we say it, that the likely counterfactual is that people focus far more on the process given the outcome is cast off as something that is far more random. But second, we still think there are likely to be values associated with hard work, given that people still work very hard and people still have passions and still people have interests. And we think it's an irrational belief that you would have on their side of the house that you accredit things to the randomness, the hyperbolic instant that our opponents do. I'm gonna first do some direct response before I reconstruct some of our arguments, before giving a third argument about increasing redistribution, which will crystallize our impacts from first argument. So first, let's talk about their argument that why you do not get success on our side of the house. They tell you like, like really the same mechanism, like two sides of the same point. One, that you won't feel good when you feel success, you'd rather feel dejected. And second, that when you lose or like you don't do something well, that you won't feel absolutely devastated. I wanna do a couple responses. Number one, let's do a flip. Why is it bad that you don't feel as much hurt and that, for example, when you mess up your violin recital, that you might accredit it to something that, you know, like maybe you didn't sleep much or to factors that you couldn't control? We think this is a good thing because it helps you identify the problem better, but doesn't endlessly, you know, go at your feeling of self-worth and it doesn't go endlessly in terms of like what you think you could have done. But let's do a couple more flips. Flip number two, I think dejection is far worse on their side of the house where you ignore random factors and where in your hard work does not succeed. We think it is far worse on their side when someone fails to get into college because they can't afford it or for example, have to qualify for financial aid, but their side of the house is like, nope, it's you, it's your personal choices that landed there. We say dejection is far worse on their side. But third, let's do another flip like uh, directly against our arguments as to why they get more success. We think on our side of the house, we focus far more on the process rather than focusing on what the outcome is, given that on our side, you know, we think of the outcome as a product of random factors. We think this is a world where you get far more success and you focus on exactly why you're failing. And we think this is a preferable world, even in terms of their argument. Second argument they give is on minorities and like, I guess like prisoners, which they, for some reason, group together. Two reasons. One, let's flip this. I think, uh, I think, all of the kinds of like right wing narratives as to why black people are in the position they are in are far greater on their side of the house where you accredit things directly to personal choice and mute the kinds of things about like random circumstances that people find themselves and the residues of the past. But second, I would say that you there is far more emphasis on random factors on our side for reasons Cam gave. But I also want to note this uh, uniquely on our side, unlocks discussions on things like white privilege, which are random, which are not things that are accredited to personal choice, but do very much accredit to your success. So once again, their argument on minorities flips. Both of their arguments are flips on, on, within this debate. Before I move on to some reconstruction, I'll let our opponents defend themselves. Yeah. On our side, black people are constrained by the choices available to them. On your side, black people are viewed as just people who are innately violent and therefore aren't worth helping. This sounds to me that black people have fewer choices in the world right now. Why is this the case? These are case, these are the thing, the reasons because of things like white privilege that are not accredited to their personal choices, but are random factors that they do not control. So I think our side of the house fits, gives you a far better explanation. Let's do some reconstruction. First on arbitrariness and like dealing with success. Cam gave you an argument as to why they aggravate, you know, like these kinds of narratives versus on our side where we get recognition. Number one, they try to say that success isn't arbitrary without actually engaging with the analysis as to why things like birth lottery and things like, for example, randomness affect. So if they want to contest this, they need to take down the argument. But furthermore, let's just actually think about it. I think all of the reasons we gave you do apply even if you work harder, as in, it doesn't change the fact that I am poor, if I'm born born to a family that has no money to send me to college, even if I study harder. So their response doesn't work. But second, they try to say that we can account for things in your background and thus, you know, like say like you going from poor to lower middle income can still be defined as success. I'm gonna flip this. Why is this not the case? Because people who control the narrative of quote unquote, what is success is controlled by the most successful in our, in our, in our, in our society. People like Warren Buffett, people like Elon Musk who are ultra 
ultra wealthy and have the ability to message what is success. We think these people want to frame success more towards like their personal choice and their ethic and try to mute things like, you know, randomness, given they do not want to frame themselves as just random consequences and want to frame themselves as people who did go do good and worked very hard. So I think this argument as to why you can reframe success into like relativity does not work on their side. Rather, all of our arguments are once again strengthened in, within this. Second argument we gave you on individual happiness didn't get much like engagement. I'm going to do some weighing here. If our argument is like, which I think they can see to a certain extent, people are happier on our side. Why is this more important than their argument about like more success? Two reasons. Number one, on the magnitude of impact in terms of affecting people. We think it is far more important to help those who inevitably have to lead unsuccessful to mediocre lives to actually get, gain self-actualization and not to continuously shame them and continuously tell them that they were the ones who put themselves in that position and not accredit these things. We think in, in terms of the effect, the number of people who are more important. But second, notice that happiness is an end to the uh, success, like sorry, success is a means to the end of happiness. Meaning if you are given the choice between the means and the ends of happiness, you ought to choose panel happiness given people only try to be successful given you are happy at the end of it. I think for those reasons, we gave you one, the more important impact, but second half flipped all of their arguments while first further strengthening ours. Third argument about why we increase redistribution. I think there are two reasons for this directly. One, we think more people, including the ultra wealthy, are willing to give back to society because they see those who are less fortunate as not necessarily just like less hardworking or people who didn't have the work ethic, but rather people who are victims of circumstances, the same circumstances that they could be victim to in a different world or maybe later down the line. But second, I think on our side of the house, you increase the public appetite to tax wealth, given it is seen more as a random consequence than rather just a product of personal gain. This looks like for more people voting for things like windfall taxes, people you know voting for more mechanisms to tax wealth. The impact is one, more people are willing to give back to give back to society and not do things like evade taxes or do things like to minimize the amount of social contact that they have with society in terms of welfare. But second, I think people are just willing to give back more into the system given they have far more empathy, given they can see themselves in the shoes of those who are less fortunate, given they see those kind of status positions as products of, of, of randomness. Why is this a very important impact in this round and an independent path to victory? I think this is simply because of the reason that poverty kills millions a year and thousands every day, not because society does not have the capital to solve these issues, but rather because society and those who are more privileged refuse to extend a lifeline to those who need it the most. We think on proposition world where people are, have a greater empathy those, to those who are victims of circumstance, we think this is a world where welfare is more effective, where the social safety net is expanded and people more reliably pay into a system that can help society. We're proud to stand on a side that uplifts millions, if not tens of millions of every year from the depths of poverty. But let's be very clear as to why we take this debate. On one level, we address the reality, which is that success is arbitrary and those who benefit from the arbitrariness frame success. But two, that we allow people to be happier. But three, we allow the worse off to be better in terms of escaping poverty. I think that is three zero for Vietnam. All right, it's time to speak for that speech. Uh, checking if the panel is ready. All right, uh, to continue this debate for the opposition, can we have the second speaker of the opposition? Here, here. Can I be heard okay? Cool. I'm actually, I'm going to do this 
I start? Chair adjudicators, ladies and gentlemen, when people looked at their lives in Montgomery in the 1950s, they faced a massive challenge, a challenge that seemed insurmountable, a challenge which was significantly bigger than doing well in the World Schools debating championships or performing well in your violin recital. Only when people thought that they had the power, when they had the agency to actually change those things, did people stand up for their rights. And because Vietnam does not engage with that fundamental claim of our second argument, because Vietnam doesn't understand what it means to believe in yourself, to have agency, to have control over your own life, they're going to lose this debate. Three questions in this speech. Firstly, what is the comparative? Secondly, on success. And thirdly, on social change. Firstly, what is the comparative? What is our claim? Firstly, note that our world is the status quo based on emotion. So your knowledge of the status quo should probably inform uh, why you think our side is believable. But our claim is that you are in control of your own destiny, but at the same time, it is viewed and understood within your, within your own context and within the circumstances of your life. What are Vietnam's two responses to this context or to this uh, comparative? Firstly, they say that we think so success is an objective metric and that they can only have a subjective metric, which they call progress. What is the response to this? Panel, consider the individuals who are around you, right? They are probably the individuals with whom you are most similar. They work with you. They've assumed similar level of education, they're from a similar background, they live in a similar country, they have access to the same social services. And what that means is, is even if you take Vietnam at their very best, success is not necessarily subjective or objective. It is objective within a subjective context. And that comparative enough, taking Vietnam at their very best, is enough for us to win this debate. What is their second claim? Their second claim is that the individuals with large amounts of power decide what is and is not success and that that conception will be a bad one which favours them. The first thing to say is that I think my subjective objective distinction defeats this. But secondly, note that there is a massive public appetite for that not to be the case, right? If you believe Vietnam that most people are not successful or that they're not successful in this Jeff Bezos metric that they want to have, well then surely the public appetite is this for this not to be the case. Surely when you have things like social media, when you have things like lower bar barriers to entry to social or to, to public conversations, to online conversations, at that point, all of the individuals who this would be a bad thing for get their voice heard and that conception of success is not the one that Vietnam wants to have. So what is the difference between the two sides? On the micro level, the reason you do better or worse than your average is due to how much effort you put in. On their side, it was due to random factors. It was because the test didn't suit you rather than you didn't study hard enough. On the macro level on our side is that ultimately you can be in control of your own destiny. If you work hard enough, you can own a home. It might not be the biggest home. It might not have a jacuzzi, but if you work, you will be able to own a home. On their side, you won't be able to because you were born poor or you weren't intelligent. You can't succeed. Panel, this was a debate near the middle, but both sides had to stand over something very clear. And I think it's clear what Team Ireland had to stand up. Second question, success. What is our claim? That there exists a large degree of agency and that means people are more successful on our side and that that success is more meaningful because you did it. Note that Vietnam does not respond to the second half of that point, so I'm only going to deal with the first. Their response is just to say that success is arbitrary. But our point, our analysis shows that success is not arbitrary and often determined by your efforts, right? They don't actually engage with those four mechanisms sufficiently. But let's say on their side of the house, or sorry, that on our, let, let's take their claim at their best, their claim that people are made feel insufficient and bad when they fail, right? That's their big claim. I have four responses here. The first is to say that we don't think most people, people fail, right? We think people are successful in life. They have a family, a husband, a wife, an education, a job, a hobby that they spent lots of time on. But secondly, even if you fail, you also succeed and you focus more on those successes, right? So if you're not married, you might have a good job. If you don't have a good job, you might be very good at a certain hobby, like debating. Why are people more likely to focus on those successes and therefore consider themselves or view themselves in this successful context? A, these individuals have optimism bias, which means they just spend more time thinking about the good things, right? It's easier to spend time thinking about the good things or understanding yourself in relation to these good things than it is in relation to these bad things, because, well, that would make you sad. Second reason, B, the fact that you have been successful in this respect means that this thing is just more important to your life, right? If you don't have a good job, but you have a very nice family, you've probably invested all of your time in that family and think that that family is the important thing. You spend your time with that family, you begin to leave, believe that it's the most important and therefore understand yourself as successful in that context. But three, let's concede that most people fail, which like doesn't make any sense. Why are these people still better off on their side? And this responds to what they call their strategic note in the second probe, right? 
On their side, these people are just resigned to the reality of failure, right? They're failing. They are sad. They are helpless. On our side, these people have something they can work towards, right? They have a vocation. Why should you weigh this thing as significantly more important than the shame that they claim is associated uh, with failure on their side? Because if everyone is failing, it's not clear why anyone is failing, right? If everyone is guilty, well, then no one is guilty. So if everyone is failing, then this is the thing that I say at the beginning of the speech, it's not clear why there's any shame associated with that anymore, right? It's only shameful when you're in the minority, when you're the individual that everyone else is looking at. But fourth response, there are still reasons you don't feel terrible when you fail, right? Even if you yourself want to feel terrible, you have family and friends who just aren't going to criticize you, right? Their analysis or the, 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 the thing that we can stand over just does not apply to every individual. If you do really terribly at something, your friend is not going to be like, on our side of the house, oh my God, you needed to work harder. You're the worst. You're a failure. You're a disgrace. They're going to be like, okay, bad luck. You, you know, you'll, you'll do better next time. There's no need to worry about it. Everything will be okay. That's what the friend does on our side of the house. That's another way to deal with their claim. Before you move on to the third clash, I'll take a point of information. If that is the case, how do you get any of your motivation, given that you'll still feel good about your failure? No one's you, you. you just ignored what I said. It's like, in, in certain instances, certain people like your friends and family are going to you know, minimize the harm while you can still maximize the benefit by working hard. Like, separate the two groups there pretty clearly. Okay, third question, social change. What is our claim? Only when people think they can change social structures are their barriers overcome. Their response is basically to say that we need discussions on things like social justice because it's seen as your own fault. But there is a distinction here, right? They can perhaps claim that we need discussion on issues like redistribution, but not on race or sexuality. Because race or sexuality was a random factor. It was something you never had control over. So this response in that context did not make very much sense. And Second thing, note the tension here. What do I say in my intro? These things are required, these things are the things that require the most effort. So if they want the rest of their analysis or their benefits to accrue, they also need to concede that these things are possible. Last claim, I'm going to respond to their idea that we get better redistribution and other social benefits on their side of the house. I have three responses. Firstly, what I said earlier, you can only redistribute money. But secondly, I'm not sure why they get any more redistribution from, for us for three reasons. A, note that poor people in most of the world vote for redistribution policies on our side of the house, right? Even if they're totally free market and think that everything is their fault, it's still in their interest to vote for redistribution policies and to, you know, amount as much money as they possibly can. But B, some people are still better off on their side of the house and it is their, in their own self-interest to vote for policies which make them richer, to vote for things which make them wealthier, etc. And C, these individuals I talk about in part B are the most powerful people, right? They can control the vote the most. They can still do things like advertising. That is all to say that I think this is pretty marginal. But C panel, even if you think they get equal redistribution, I don't necessarily know why this is better. As long as you believe my first speaker's analysis, that we have a certain degree of agency and, uh, and you're able to control your own life to a certain extent, I don't know why the status quo isn't okay. It seems to me that in our world, we have a balance. People vote for redistribution because it is in their interest, but redistribution is not crazy because people recognize that they have agency. That is the fairest. People feel better when they succeed. People understand and have a reasonable conception of success on our side of the world, and people are able to fight for their rights. On Team Vietnam, they fail to understand this. That's why they're going to lose the debate. All right, I intend to speak. <coughs> Sorry about that. I intend to speak up for that speech, uh, checking if the panel is ready. All right, to continue this debate for the proposition, uh, can we have the third speaker of the proposition? Here, here. Um, am I currently visible in audio? Thank you. I just one second. Um, to set up my time. Uh, yep, and if you could also indicate your POI preference, yep. that will be great, yeah. Yeah, um, okay. I'll take POIs verbally. Uh, I have no preferred to do pronouns. Uh, okay, my speech will start. My speech will start in three. Oh, sorry, my speech will start now. Panel, notice how the first minute of 01 knives their own case and their entire stats. They say that people recognize that not everyone's starting in the same place, 
So then isn't that acknowledging that arbitrary factors influence whether you are successful? Op stance necessitates a lack of consideration of these factors and the fact that there are certain things like where you were born, what race you were born as, does influence whether you achieve success. The fact that they base their entire first speech on the um, first half of the first speech on things like, oh, people will recognize that you start a certain place, but then whether or not you work after that is what they use to determine where you get success. Look, you can't have their kick and eat it too, right? You can't say that, oh, people will recognize that there are arbitrary factors, but then they will also recognize hard work. That is not what this debate is about. Opposition has to defend a world in which they defend, um, where they protect only recognizing things like hard work or personal actions as what led to your success. Secondly, opposition's case is largely dependent on this notion of like relative micro successes. Look, if it is relative success, there's no incentive to try harder because you think it's enough. They undercut their own impact, right? Because you think that every single little thing can be success, every single relative thing can be success, then you don't have any motive to try harder because where you are now can be considered success to you because what you return it. Is open it asks, right? Our question suggests that we place the very goal itself based on arbitrary factors in second speech because uh, the factors like where you're from, this undercuts their impact, right? Because the very goal itself is set based upon arbitrary factors, then the process upon which you reach that goal is also influenced by this and is also seen under a light that is influenced by this, right? Therefore, on opposition, um, Therefore, from the very beginning, opposition undercuts their own impact. Before we on the main clashes, one main assumption upon which opposition's case rests. Their case is largely contingent on the idea that this narrative makes you more motivated, which makes you more successful. All the benefits of enacting agency or uplifting minorities is dependent on being able on having these two links, making you more motivated and making you more successful. If we can break these two links, we're able to break down the majority of their impacts, if not all. This takes me on to the two main clashes in this debate. Number one, on quality of life. A few things we get from opposition on this. Number one, they tell the people don't try hard enough to improve themselves because of their destiny was never in their control. Number two, they pivot from the challenge is insurmountable to agency. Number three, they tell you that like only on their side, people think they have um they have the ability to change, therefore only on their side it work. Number one, this is untrue. Humans have an incentive to find value in something. We focus on working hard, for example, debating or finding passion in progression rather than the results. For example, look, this looks like pressuring people into becoming their DC champions on the opposition side of the house. We saw from the very first speech that we still have things like progress upon which we can focus and upon which we can target the efforts and to work. We still have progress. Uh, the thing on our, that is different from opposition is we don't force people to make, to, we don't put this toxic pressure upon people to get success. And we don't tell them that, hey, if you fail and you aren't able to get the success, it's all because of you. Because you recognize that arbitrary factors exist and largely influence it. But also secondly, let's point out to you why on opposition, they don't get access to the impacts of like making you more successful because people are still, because people still give up. If you look at the status quo, you see the fact that it's, extremely easy to feel discouraged on opposition side of the house. For example, if you keep trying, but you don't succeed and you attribute it to your personal actions which led to failure, you feel doubtful of yourself and you feel hopeless, right? Because you spent 10 years of your life working to, to get a certain job, for example, then once you apply, you don't get it. You think this is all your fault. You're hopeless as a person because you tried all these things and it didn't work. All of your efforts were for nothing. This makes it on the opposition side, A, far easier for people to give up because they think that they can continue working forever. They, and their efforts are still leading to their failure, they won't want to continue. They want to go on because they themselves are the cause of their failure. But secondly, you have to think like burnout. For example, if you worked hard, but you didn't succeed, your narrative is, it's my fault, I have to work harder, which leads you into this toxic cycle of continuing, continuously putting more and more and more in, even if you don't get the same amount back, because success, as we already tell you, is largely determined by arbitrary factors, for example, whether or not you were born into a rich family. Therefore, in opposition, even if people don't give up, they get burnt out and are unable to continue working because there is that kind of toxic pressure upon them. They're never able to stop because the moment they stop, they're being told that they're lazy, they're a sad person, this, right? And thirdly, on opposition, they have misguided efforts. You have a false cause and effect attribution. For example, you think a certain action helped you succeed, even though it was just luck, and then you reapply it and it doesn't work a second time. So you have you go down this constant cycle of trying the wrong things, you're never getting where you need to be because you don't recognize that luck was a part of it, that arbitrary factors were a part of it. For example, you get paid less as a woman, not necessarily always because you worked less, um, your work is less goes than a certain man, but if you just are attribute that to you not working hard enough, you constantly try the wrong things and never actually get to where you want to be. Therefore, the bottom line is, in opposition, they are unable to get this kind of success as well. But also, you always have hard work, but the large reason why you succeed is luck. You can succeed with luck and without hard work, but can I succeed with hard work and without luck? 
finally, let's break the idea on like motivating people to work harder. Look, people do not want to be confronted by their own failures because they're scared that they're not enough. We allow people to try more because they know that even if they fail, it isn't fully because they were a sad person who did, who like, whose efforts didn't result to anything, right? Our proposition, we give people the ability to escape from this toxic pressure, to work harder, and to always work towards a certain thing that they won't necessarily achieve because the world may be tilted against them. We shift the bulk of our attention away from success and towards progress. We allow people to do things that will make them happy instead of do things that will, you know, feed into this notion of success they might that, that they might not necessarily achieve. Therefore, in the first clash of the quality of life, number one, on opposition, they are unable to actually provide to these people a guarantee that they will succeed. But the only thing they provide is a constant and toxic pressure to keep grinding, to keep hustling, to keep working more and more and more and to, until you get to like the Chinese goal for like 996. And at that point, you get people who break off, right? Because we aren't able to continue anymore and you have a giant decrease in the quality of life. No matter how much like idea of agency you have, if you only push people towards a life where they keep working and they don't get there because success, uh, because Hard work doesn't guarantee that you do. You don't improve people's lives. Second class then on minorities. We get a few ideas from opposition. Number one, people challenge these barriers because they're not defined by them, because it's easier to justify certain groups as inferior because they were born that way. Number two, they tell you in your POI that on up, black people are constrained by the choices available to them on prop they're seen as more violent. Let's deal with this in this. Number one, up shoots themselves in the foot within their very reasoning for this argument. Things like being constrained by choices available, as said in the POI to our second speaker, is a random factor because you don't determine which choices are available to you. The arbitrary family into which you were born, the arbitrary wealth of, in which you grew up, the arbitrary location in which you grew up did. But trying to say that people view certain groups as being born violent, why is this relevant? Because as the second speaker said themselves, if the debate happens to the status quo, because that's what their side supports, this doesn't lie within the question of what caused your success. It lies within the question of do you have a certain prejudice? And are up, the answer is yes. Racism still exists in the rest of the house. It doesn't go away just because you think you caused your success. Therefore, in opposition, they are unable to actually prove to you why for these specific groups of minority um, people, you get a better quality of life, you get better circumstances, you get, get better outcomes. But also, secondly, the idea of people not being defined by your barriers is also an exclusive. If they are their own characterization, who view minority groups as being constrained by the choices available to them, this happens to be true. Thirdly, the reality is that one individual African-American, for example, does not have the capacity to completely change the discrimination in themselves. Agency does not address the challenges being insurmountable. But also, let's flip this. Opposition does far worse for minority groups because they shift the burden to change onto these minorities instead of onto the system that is oppressing them. The necessary lack of consideration for arbitrary factors when accrediting success fully to personal actions means that things like you were born into a few resources, you went as a gold minority, are discarded. This is like saying, oh, you're a woman. You're getting paid less time because prejudice exists because you didn't work as hard as that other man across the officer room. Instead of recognizing that arbitrary factors exist, you put the burden onto these people to solve issues that they did not cause. Prop, on the other hand, uniquely gets social change because people recognize that their success wasn't necessarily caused by their own work, for example, if they're at the very top of the social hierarchy and would be changed because they are now don't have to confront them maybe not being as, you know, um, maybe not being as hardworking, maybe not being as simple as they thought they would be. Therefore, what we get from proposition is A, the greater social change, B, room for people to actually work towards progressing without having toxic pressure, number three, a better world for minorities. Therefore, good proposition, thank you. All right, thank the speaker for that speech. Uh, checking if the panel is ready. All right, so con to conclude the substantive portion of this debate, can we have the third speaker of the opposition? Thank you. Ready? Chair, adjudicators, ladies and gentlemen. Three things in this speech. Firstly, a clarification on the arbitrary, uh, arbitrariness of birth and our narrative. Then a question, firstly, on what happens to the most vulnerable in a world where this narrative is prevalent. And second, I'm gonna talk about dissatisfaction on, on which side of the house you get better internal satisfaction with most people. So first on the clarification, we think that the birth lottery 
does limit you. And we acknowledge that in first. Our narrative was that some factors are fixed, but others are variable that you can control. We think this is why in the status quo, scholarships reserved for minorities aren't given out by means of lottery, but are still giving out, given out on a meritocratic basis. So they're still given out to the best performing minority. That is what our side looks like. Given that mechanisms like these exist, things like scholarships, things like quotas, we think that social mobility was possible on our side of the house. But the important thing to note here is that they can't push us to the extreme like they have done. So we can only defend and personal actions and nothing else. In that case, they would have to defend a world in which no one believes that free will exists, which would obviously be a ridiculous burden to push onto them. First area of push, what happens to the most vulnerable? Our path to victory in this debate was as such, that social mobility is made easier due to social movements that can only occur on our side of the house. And secondly, given that that social mobility is easier, our side also motivates these individuals within these groups to do better. Theirs was that they got more policies like redistribution. Let's first engage with our path to path to victory. Why were minorities better off on our side of the house? In the last 100 years, social movements and their efforts have broken down structural barriers for minorities who had been locked out for years, only because they recognized that they had the ability and the capacity to, that, to do that within their own actions. Why was this so important? Why was the existence of our narrative a tipping point for this? Firstly, these barriers are so large. We need motive, lots of motivation to spearhead and be involved in social movements. And even if our narrative distorts reality to a certain extent, if we don't think it does, we think this is necessary, this distortion to mobilize and galvanize support for things like the civil rights movement. They say that their side is necessary for recognition of these problems in the very first place. But this is just a bizarre response because African Americans can obviously comprehend context in history and identify that it is the state that has marginalized and neglected them for years. It is not exclusive to their side that they get that recognition. So how did they get things like the civil rights movement and the gay rights movement on their side of the house if they thought that those things were insurmountable? They never gave us a good response to that. But secondly, this means that it is not insurmountable for minorities to achieve success on our side. They will strive for success as per our first point, and we think it is likely that they will get some success as per the thing, uh, the social movement analysis that we gave you in our first speech. I would just also point out that a lot of minorities who are discriminated against in the status quo in social spheres do quite well in academics and in their career. And they are far worse off on their side of the house. In the status quo, when Asian Americans do disproportionately better in exams, people accept that that is because they worked harder. On, our, on their side of the house, they just resent Asian Americans for being the recipients of luck. That is an act of harm for them. Okay, let's talk about their paths for you then. Things like uh, policies like redistribution. Firstly, one of the main barriers to achieving these policies is not nebulous societal narrative, but it's selfishness. It's things like being unwilling to pay more tax money, and so you vote for conservative economic policies. There are also competing reasons as to why the right is powerful on both sides of the class. So having really rich donors, for example, that oppose redistributive policies. They don't care about things like narratives. Really rich individuals care about the amount of figures in their bank account, because that is what is much more proximal to them. That is, is, is a response to their third argument that came out of Prop 2. Secondly, they don't explain what populism say on their side. We don't understand why populists can't also scapegoat immigrants on their side of the house. They can st say things like uh, still accuse them of stealing their jobs. And in fact, this line of attack is strengthened on their side of the house when people know that it is a product of these immigrants' conscious actions that uh, is causing them to take their jobs. Populists are honestly just opportunists that will exploit whatever narrative the public will buy into. On their side, it probably looks like things like what we point out in our POIs, but there's no point in giving these people money because they're just inherently lazy and will misuse it. Misuse it. But another response uh, to respond to what the, how the public perceives and interacts with minorities now. Some people are just racist, and just because people perceive minorities to be poor due to random factors in their side of the house doesn't mean that racism is eliminated. They just attribute it to other random factors to do with problems with that race, for example, stereotypes types like black fathers abandon their children and that system of failure still persists on their side. They did not get redistribution, we got social change. What is the way in here? Even if they give people a baseline income, our argument about social movements is just far more important because not only does it mean that minorities are just treated better on a cultural level, but they're also motivated to work harder and to earn more income than they give them. So we won this clash, but also we don't think that this was necessarily the most important clash in the round, even if we didn't, uh, even if we didn't win this clash. Why was that the case? Firstly, they can see that there's lots of barriers contributing to economic disenfranchisement that are out of people's control. So things like global instability, things like recessions. This means that people are probably going to be quite poor on both sides of the house. But secondly, this argument assumes that all successes are economic, but in fact it is not. And we claim that the most valuable successes are oftentimes the ones that are not of this nature. Before I move on to the second clash then, I'll take a POI. 
narratives like the one you talk about, like the hardworking Asian American, are what create things like model minority myths that create that make minorities hate one another and move back on social movements. Um, we think it is ridiculous to say that social movements will be reversed just because there's a little bit of tension within uh, a minority group. Like really great policies like quotas and scholarships not going to be reversed just because like there's some tension in, in, in a model minority stereotype. But also if you weigh this against our argument about a really important social change happening in the first place, like it obviously just doesn't stack up. We don't think that was an important claim in this debate. Second area of clash then on internal satisfaction. Proposition's main push is that people feel worse in their failure because they themselves feel incompetent. Firstly though, I wanna engage with this idea of objective success that they give us. Lots of successes we think are just specific to your own context that the public sphere does not have access to. So for example, your specific goal might be to be really good at piano, which society does not have the technical knowledge to know what a successful pianist looks like. So this is to say that a lot of the times, success is determined by your own metric and not one of society's. What did we tell you then? We firstly told you that there is more motivation to try hard on our side of the house when people fail. And this reduces a lot of their benefits about failure and feeling bad, because at least on our side, people can recognize that there are pathways out of that failure who are not doomed to a life of sadness and, uh, and just lack of success that they condemn people to. Their side has no such relief. Their third response by saying people now on our side give up or burn out because they have to work really, really, really hard. Our argument, like they say, is about the mediocre life. Like that is their own characterization. Most people are not competing to get a job in Goldman Sachs or getting into Harvard. So in most cases, this argument about burnout doesn't apply to the vast majority of the population. But to flip their claim, people feel far worse about the world in which they live when they feel locked into their failure forever, because that is just far more long-term and a fundamental dissatisfaction with the world around them. We think that that was a far more pernicious harm for them. But also people felt far better about themselves when they succeeded in our side because it reflects on their own competence rather than just being random as they claim. This is important because in mediocre lives, everybody can also have some successes, working really hard in your relationships, being a better debater, for example. So the scope of these benefits is massive. They didn't engage sufficiently. And it was for all of those reasons that we were very proud to. All right, I thank the speaker for that speech. Uh, checking if the panel is ready. Uh, Abhishek? <coughs> All right, to conclude this debate for site opposition, uh, can we have the reply speaker of the opposition? Here, here. <clears throat> Chair, adjudicators, ladies and gentlemen. On their side, I believe that due to the arbitrariness of birth, I was born with poor communication skills, meaning I don't try to fix the poor communication that I have in my relationships because that was static. That was the fate of the universe. But on our side, I believe that my poor communication skills can be overcome by practicing, by reading books about the issue. And I can make an effort to try and save my relationships with my significant others, with my friends, with my parents. And over the course of my entire life, the cumulative sum of believing that you can improve your lot in life, that you just don't give up, amounted to a huge, large improvement in your quality of life. That was an impact that ultimately could not be written off and is ultimately the reason why Team Ireland won this debate. I'm first gonna talk about satisfaction. We told you on, our, on their side, first of all, when you win, it feels empty. A good relationship, a good job, being good at a hobby. That was never your own doing. And the more they push this arbitrariness point, the more empty every success feels. Because note the reason that people work hard is for the feeling of success at the very end. Of it. If there is no achievement in your sense of success, i.e. that all of the hard work you did was none of your own, there's no sense of achievement and there's no point in working hard. Meaning if they cared about success, they got less of it. The second thing we told you was about when you lose. It also wasn't your fault. 
you don't need to take responsibility ever because any time you failed was about the outside factors outside of your control. If nothing is ever your fault, you will not try to work hard. In response to this, they say, the first thing they offer is a definition of good. They say, well, success in your world is not about micro successes, guys. It's about what the delete, elite define it as. But clearly this just wasn't grounded in reality for the reasons my second speaker gives. The fact that people congratulate you on status quo when you celebrate your one year anniversary with your significant other, when people celebrate when you get your first house, your first child, or after performing well at a recital, those in their language was also a subjective accept, success, even if you take them at their best. But note also that this definitional quibble was insufficient because our successes were in the debate. And given that these were the types of micro successes that occurred millions of times throughout every single person's life, you should weigh this claim above theirs. Then they say that you could be, uh, uh, that you will be worse off when you fail, right? Because now it's the case that you actually don't feel as bad because you realize that you're outside mitigating factors. But note that if you believe their definition of success, then most people could never be successful because most people were never going to become Jeff Bezos or Warren Buffett or whoever else they define as success. Meaning people are just worse on their side of the house and not as happy because they could never live up to the own definition they define. On our side, people believe that you could try again. Don't worry about it. You can just improve. You can improve your interview performance. So next time you can get that job. Like performance was not static. Moreover, more people just fit into our definition of what success counted like. They seem to have an like incredibly narrow conception of like, it means success is getting a job in Goldman Sachs and making like over a hundred thousand a year. That was incredibly, incredibly specific. Most people were never going to live those lives. Most people lived mediocre lives and they could access those benefits on our side. The importance of this claim is that you must weigh this because it means affects every single person in this debate to some extent because the minor wins and the minor setbacks in their life occurred millions of times over their entire life. Finally then briefly, I wanna talk about minorities and social movements. The importance of this claim cannot be understated. As we told you in the US, civil and political rights were achieved for black people only because they were able to think, yes, my lot in life is not static. It's not fixed. This was not the result of random factors. This was a result of an active choice of oppression. Now on our side, when I can try and change that, I can now go out and I can protest. I fight for my rights and I fight for a better quality of life that is ultimately worth living. Those social movements and minorities were ultimately something that we could only achieve. Their quick quibble about people saying, well, on our side, people just vote for right-wing politicians ultimately was out of this debate because as I pointed out at first and we reiterated down the bench, these things already existed in status quo. Things that we are aware of people's backgrounds, aware of people's privileges, and we offer things like photos and scholarships that corrected for that as a result. We've never been prouder to oppose. All right, I thank the speaker for that speech. Checking if the panel is ready. All right, to conclude okay. this debate for site proposition, uh, as well as the octo finals of WSDC as a whole, can we have the reply speaker of the proposition? Here, here. All right. Three, two. Panel, opposition stance by reply is twofold. Number one, proposition has to defend fate, but opposition is about recognition of both fate, as in I was born in a certain way, and hard work. We think it's so far as you can succeed with luck and no skill, but not skill and no luck. We think we should prioritize arbitrary factors more than hard work in on its own. But let's get further engaged. If success is as relative as they say they uh, as they say it is, they do not get access to their benefit on motivating minorities to get level with white people because they accept their conception of success as being framed by arbitrary factors. There is no motivation on their side of the house. Instead, on the, uh, on the other flip side, we told you that you actually shame these kind of people the most. Let's look at why our side of the house is far more compelling in our characterization. We think when proposition is preaching the narrative of, oh, if you work hard enough, you'll get out of the hood or whatever, they will, and these black people, let's say they will mostly and will statistically fail, it is far more likely that now these people think they are not good enough and will not try again. Why do we think they will not try again? Because people don't want to be confronted by their own failures because they're scared that they're confronted by the fact that they're not good enough. So when opposition just pushes this into their face, people are Far too scared to attempt to try in the first place. You shame them, not motivate them. 
Furthermore, we actually flip this argument of theirs by saying the way we motivate people is by creating non-consequential attempts for them. We allow them an escape pathway in order to not have to actually delegate the consequences or rejections of life that is due to arbitrary factors to themselves. We think this is a far better procession that is that that is um, that far better maintains mental health stability, uh, especially for the most vulnerable stakeholder. And for that, that is the reason why on their side of the house, they do not win on those who need motivation the most. But let's engage on the median cases and just working class people who are earning a good life. They honestly have no responses here, but just try to weigh it out like, oh, this is not that important. It's not that many people. Okay. We think this is actually the most magnitude of stakeholders because literally most midlife crisis, which is very prevalent, by the way, do happen because these are the people who become depressed because of their rejections of success, because they think that their current state in life isn't good enough for self-actualization of happiness, because they think they do not reach a societal standard of success. Because if, furthermore, panel, if necessary, would go as far as to reject motivation as a whole for these people, because when hard work mean, does not mean success, Success, we think it is far more preferable to focus on things like taking care of your family than wasting time and risking burnout. So at the end of the day, panel, we think on the most uh, on on the stakeholders that uh, the the stakeholders with the most popular. Uh, I think the speaker dropped out, so I have just stopped the time at two forty eight. Uh, I think Jonghao is not in the same place as them, so if Jonghao could contact them and see if they could come back. And then we'll continue from that point onwards. Uh, she's making her way back onto the call. Um, let me just give her maybe a couple seconds. Thank you. Could the org com be told to let our speaker? Yeah, in? Uh, I messaged on the Discord um, to let them in. Yeah. Hi, yep, confirming. Yep, Cam, yep, okay. Uh, so Cam, the last thing we heard, so I've, hang on, you can't see the message, give me a sec. So I've stopped the timer at two minutes and 48 seconds. Uh, so you have about one minute and 12 each seconds left. Uh, the last thing I heard was something along the lines of how if hard work isn't success, uh, it is far better for individuals to take care of their family and avoid burnout. Uh, could members of the panel confirm if that's around the last thing you heard as well? Yep, okay, yeah, so that's what we heard last. Uh, the timer is on the um the chat, so whenever you're ready, you may continue from that point onwards. Okay, three, two, one. We think in so far as opposition is actively uh, harming the mental health of the people who would on our side of the house be perfectly content we think their harms far outweigh the benefits but thirdly let's engage on the third stakeholders that they also just gave a very wishy-washy uh, uncharitable response to we think these are the people who are awarded with the most privilege and who are not called out for the kind of privilege they uh, they, uh, they possess 
we think that we have seen people being called out before, but we don't, we also think that even if we don't get pe these people to buy into things like uh, affirmative action, we call out people who are traditionally considered successful, not uh, think people like Elon Musk, for instance, who did a success for hard work, but because he was born into an emerald mine. We think these are the important factors that we have to call out, not only to, to put these people into accountable, but also to actually not to demotivate the people who are trying to be as to progress and to improve themselves as so, uh, uh, to, and, uh, and then become better. We think at the end of the day, Op proposition alone lessen the burden for those who bear it the most heavy and call for the engagement and acknowledgement of those who have been given the most privilege. We think at the end of the day, this is what we care about, not some uh, wishy-washy, oh, uh, I'm going to motivate people because uh, they will reassess themselves and refraction or whatever. We think at the end of the day, we give you more systematic, more analysis as to how we better motivate people on, on, uh, on proposition side of the house. So proud to win on proposition. All right, I thank the speaker for that speech and I thank all six speakers for this debate. Uh, I would note that regardless of which side of the motion you believe, you wouldn't be here without your coaches. So please do thank your coaches as well after this debate. So yeah, as I said before, massive congratulations to both teams for making it this far. You've genuinely done your nation proud and regardless of the results, I think you have many things to be happy for. So what's going to happen now is that the judges are going to move to a prep room. I would say let's move to uh, prep room 6A. Uh, Opera Room 6A. Uh, let's move there. We'll start the discussion there. We'll be back in about, I want to say 20 to 30, to 30 minutes, but I suspect we'll be back in about 30 to 40 minutes. So if you need to use the toilet, now's the time to do so. All right. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording for now.